All right. Good morning. Good morning to all of my friends here in the front row. I am so excited to see you and all of my friends out there, too. Welcome to whoa, Family Sunday. And I'll explain what that is in just a moment for those of you who are like, what is this Family Sunday thing about? Um, first of all, my name is Becky. If I haven't met you, I am the Family Ministry Director here at The Gathering. And we are so excited for this nice, cozy morning inside out of the cold, right? Um, if you are new here with us today, we would love to connect with you. We have these welcome cards. You can fill it out and give it to our welcome team. And we would love to reach out and pray with you, ask, answer questions about the church. So you guys can fill that out. We also have a way you can find out some, about some amazing events we have coming up here. We have this postcard in the chairs in front of you. Um, our website has all the information of, about all the events coming up. It also has a QR code where you can sign up for our weekly newsletter email. Sound good? All right, but I have a special event I want to tell my friends about, my friends in the front row here and scattered throughout. Last summer, we went to a special place. It was an island. Ju Mystery Island. Wasn't it so much fun? That's right. It was our first ever vacation Bible school here at the gathering, and it was amazing, right, you guys? I'm still singing the songs. Anybody else singing the songs still? Come on, I know. It comes up in my random playlist, and I just let it go. Mystery Island hoo-ha. Oh, yeah. Well, this year, I know July seems far away, but it's nice to think about warm weather. I don't know about you guys, but when it's this cold, I dream about the sunshine because I'm a sunshine girl. But in July, we'll have our second vacation Bible school, and I want to show you guys where we're going to travel to this time. All right, let's show them that video. Not New York City. Not New York City. I'm sorry. Was that Grayson? It was Micah. Technical difficulties, that is, oh, there it is. Evil is on the move. Darkness spreading throughout the land, consuming so very many in its path. Some are happy to join these deadly forces, while others are simply unprepared for the battle. I knew you would come. It's time. Time for you to learn how to defend yourself. There's something I want to show you. I've been saving this for you. We have all to win this fight. Remember, we are not alone. That's right. This summer, we are going to learn how to put on the armor of God. Our teaching will be all based in Ephesians 6. So Heather and I, my co-director, we are super pumped up and excited. We're already planning it. So we just wanted to let you guys know. So on our website, you'll find information about Vacation Bible School, and we will have registration up soon. So you can tell all your friends and get them signed up. So all righty. All right, so Family Sunday. <laughs> You're probably wondering what this is. So every time we have a fifth Sunday... We keep the kids in the service with us for the entire service. They usually are dismissed after music time and they head to their classes where they get their lesson. But today, they're gonna stay with us. And what I want you to think about, how we view this Sunday, like a Pixar film. You guys know Pixar? No, maybe you guys don't, but here's, for example, the movie Up. Have anybody seen the movie Up? Okay, so think about that movie, it's colorful, there's a funny dog that talks. 
There's a grumpy old man. He's kind of funny too. A house that flies away to a far off land, right? All super fun. But in that movie, there's a powerful message for older people that your life is not done when you think it is. You have so much more to contribute to the next generation. And so within that fun, silly film, there is a deep message for everybody. Okay, so that's how I want you to view Family Sunday. Yes, the message is going to be geared towards the kids today. Pastor Bill is going to be teaching in numbers. And we just invite you to have fun this morning. We're going to do things a little bit differently. You might get a little bit silly. You might move around a little bit. And that's okay, right? We're going to have fun. All righty, so here, speaking of fun. All right, so we usually do a greeting time. But we're going to do it different today because there's snakes among us. So my team is going to be passing out envelopes right now. So you're each going to get an envelope. When you get this envelope, I'm going to ask you not to touch it, just or touch the sides. Don't look inside of it. Don't feel it. Just wait for your envelope. Does that sound good? Okay. Are you going to open the envelope until when I say not to open the envelope? No. I will tell you that when you can open this envelope. So everyone's getting their envelopes right now. And so the the idea is we have snakes among us, but it's not that kind of snake. He's cute, though. Would you guys like to meet that snake? I almost brought in a live snake, but I couldn't get myself to do it. So we didn't bring, I know, sad. All right, so you guys, hold up your envelope when you have it so I can see everyone has an envelope. All right, when I say go, oh, you don't need more than one, Callan. Thank you for sharing. All right. When I say go, you're going to peek inside your envelope. Okay, listen up. Not yet. I didn't say go. If you have a small rubber snake in your envelope, you are one of our secret snakes. So it's very important you don't show anybody else that you have a snake. Do you understand? Secret snake. Right, Gary? Secret snake. Don't, don't take it out. Keep it hidden. Thank you, Kelsey. All right. Because here's the deal. Listen up. Put your envelopes in your lap. When the music starts, we're going to go around and shake hands. So it's cozy in here. We're kind of packed in. You know, I would like, like you guys to move around a little bit. We're going to shake hands and introduce each other. We do this every single Sunday. We're a friendly church. We want to get to know each other's names. If you can't remember someone's name, you're going to say, what? Please help me remember your name, right? We do this every Sunday. And so you're going to go around and shake hands. Now, if you're one of the secret snakes, you're going to sh squeeze someone's hand twice. That means that's a snake bite, OK? If you are not one of the secret snakes, please don't be squeezing people's hands. You're not a snake. I know how you guys think. I can see you thinking already, William. I can see it. <laughs> All right, so when I say go, you're going to look inside your envelope and don't show anybody else. Right, Ray? OK, you guys ready? All right, go. Look inside really quick. Don't take the snake out. Keep him hidden. All right, so now we're going to go around. And shake hands and snakes, you're gonna bite people. Yeah. When you get bitten, you need to sit down. <laughs> I forgot that part. If you get bitten by a snake, sit down. Okay. Here we go. 
All right, all right. I got bit twice. All right, Taylor, have a seat. All right, I forgot the part of the game where if you get bit, you're supposed to sit down. That's okay. We still had fun with it. I got bit twice. Who else got bit by a snake? Yes, it was very sneaky too. Our snakes were very sneaky. They would come up and they'd be like, am I looking, are you a snake? I don't know. All right, so kiddos. Okay, and they just went for it. Well, in reality, snake bites can be very dangerous, right? We don't want to get bit by a snake. So today we're going to learn about a story where God sent snakes among the people, and then he healed the people. So at the end of today, you guys come see me, and I can give you each, if you want one, a rubber snake to remind you after the service to remind you about the lesson today. All right. A couple things for all of the adults in the house. So kiddos, if you can put your envelopes underneath your chairs for me. And I just need everyone to focus really quick. I need to tell the adults something. All right, on the way in, you guys have gotten one of our highly anticipated Discovering Jesus notebook, book, workbooks, right? You guys hold it up, hold it up. All right, so here's the deal with this. The first thing I want you to do is open to that very first page and put your name and your phone number. Because here's the deal. I don't know if you noticed, they all look the same. So we're probably going to find them laying around the church, right? Or in homes, at home gatherings. So put your name and phone number. That way you can keep track of yours because we're going to use this for the whole year. You're going to need this for the whole year. Make sense? Cool. All right. So we've been going through Discovering Jesus, and it's just been an amazing series so far. So how many have done a read through the Bible plan? Kiddos, have you ever read through the Bible, those of you who can read? It's an amazing journey. So we're doing it a little bit differently differently here at the gathering. We're going to do one book per Sunday through the whole year, and we're going to be discovering Jesus in each book of the Bible. So we've done Genesis. We've done Exodus. We did Leviticus last week, and this week we are in Numbers. So if you turn to page 8, I think it's 8. Yes, page 7 and 8. You'll find a place where you have Sunday recap. You can take notes today. And there were some passages there that you should have or hopefully read before you came to church today. Next week, we're in Deuteronomy. And you can look at the passages, read it before Sunday morning. Sound good? Okay, cool. So we are in numbers today. And actually, as we go through um, these books, we're going to be looking for three things about Jesus. We're looking for pictures of Jesus. So pictures or or types of Jesus, as we might say, like Moses is a type of Jesus. Um, We're going to look for prophecies, like in Isaiah, there's a lot of prophecies. And then we have personal appearances, which there's a fun word we say, it's Christophany. You say that? Christophany. And that's where Jesus appears before he becomes a human, before the incarnation. So we're going to be looking through that through each book. And um, Pastor Bill today is going to be showing us in numbers where we discover Jesus. But the cool part is, kiddos, we've been doing this for a year and a half. I bet they don't even know that. (laughs) Yes, we did numbers last year. So hopefully you remember this account because we've already done this story. So we'll see how much you guys remember. I think Mr. Bill is going to be asking you some questions. We'll find out. So we use what's called the Gospel Project with the kids. And it's a three-year chronological going through the Bible. And every Sunday, we have a Christ connection. So we're already doing this, you guys. So adults, you got to catch up with us. So, <laughs> alrighty. So with that said, we are in the book of Numbers. What do you guys know about the book of Numbers? Anybody in my front row? What do you know about the book of Numbers? Well, is it not a lot of names? Josiah says there's a lot of names. What testament? We have Old Testament and New Testament. Shout it out. Oh, Carmel, old over here, Carmela. It's old. Carmela's like, it's old. Do you guys know who wrote, my friends in the front row, who wrote the book of Numbers? Not the answer I was looking for. Okay, anybody out here in the the house? Moses, under the inspiration of God, wrote the book of Numbers. Does anybody know what the Hebrew title of Numbers is? Bed-Medar. You got to say it with confidence. It means wilderness. So the book of Numbers covers 39 years of the Israelites in the wilderness. So in a reading plan, if you made it through Leviticus, 
the 613 laws, you would land in numbers and you might go, oh, whoa. Another book of like numbers this does not sound fun. But there are amazing accounts in this book, as you will see, and one of them we're going to highlight today. So the overview, the overall theme of numbers is Israel's rebellion and God's mercy. Rebellion, mercy, rebellion, mercy. So I might guys check out a video here that covers the theme quite well. So here we go. The book of Numbers opens with God speaking to Moses in the wilderness. And though it opens with a census, Numbers is not about figures and digits. It's about Israel in the wilderness and their unwillingness to follow God's commandments. The main place we see this is when God sends Israel to travel to the land of promise where they hear reports that the inhabitants were like giants. No matter who their God was, Israel thought they could never triumph. And so the people disobeyed. They would not enter, they would not be compliant. And so God promised a punishment. These people would not receive the land of promise, but would die outside it in the wilderness. But Moses interceded and God heard his cry. So the younger generation would still enter the land, but everyone counted in the older generation would die. And as we trace this people through the wilderness, we see a pattern take shape. We start to notice a cycle. God gives a law or a command. Then the people rebel and disobey. So God brings a deathly punishment, but through Moses, intercession is made. And then it all gets replayed. In order to regroup, in order to regulate, God gives new commands and re-emphasizes the old ones he gave, only to see the people rebel again, fall under punishment, and need to be saved. This is the cycle in numbers. This is its constant procession, commands, disobedience, punishment, and intercession. Because this is who we are as humans. This is the result of sin's infection. Like Israel, we are stuck in this cycle. So what hope do we have to escape it? For even Moses eventually sinned. Even he had his moment of rejection and denial. So if it wasn't Moses, who would come and make a way of escape from this cycle? Well, the book of Numbers answers in an unexpected style. God speaks through a pagan named Balaam and points to a king who would come and break this cycle. And this king is Jesus. He entered into our sinful mess, but where we disobeyed, he practiced true obedience so that he could enter into the place of our punishment and be our true intercessor, our new and better Moses. For only he was worthy, only he was meritorious. So when he voluntarily allowed our punishment to fall on him, instead of dying under it, he rose victorious. So now Jesus is the way out of the wilderness. He is the way in to God's promise. He obeyed where we couldn't have, died where we should have, so we might enter into the place we never could have. So when the number of your sins are so stacked against you that you feel stuck in its downward spiral, just remember that Jesus is interceding for you and working within you to once and for all break sin's cycle. So I'm supposed to like outdo that video right now with high energy and enthusiasm. Hey, I know I'm short, but what's with this thing here? It's going on. That's better, much better. So some of you know me, some of you don't know me. My name is Bill. I'm one of the pastors here at the gathering. Good to see you. I'm glad to see each and every one of you. I'm one of the pastors here at the gathering, and I have been asked this morning to share from a portion of the book of Numbers. 
And some of this is going to be interactive with the kids and other parts of it. Um, I'll have the adults also answer. And, and Becky did a good job of explaining that we're going through this over the year. Where are the kids at? What portion of the scripture are they in? Isaiah, way ahead. We'll catch up. We'll, we'll get caught up here. So every book of the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, we've already done Genesis, which uh, you know is the book of beginnings. That's what the word means. Then we did Exodus, where they exited Egypt. It's easy to remember. Then we did Leviticus last week, which is easy to remember because Levi's are not genes. Levi's are priests. So the Levites, it's, a, it's the book that talked about the priests and what their role was in Israel as they uh, ventured towards the promised land. And now we are in the book of Numbers, which of course is named after what? Like what, like what kind of weird name is that? Numbers. And I think somebody said it over here when you were talking, Becky. The reason why this book Numbers is called Numbers is because it's actually the census taken of the people as they were traveling from Egypt. One is a number, you're correct. One is the loneliest number. <laughs> but the, as the people were leaving Egypt, going to the promised land, they were, they were counted. And you know there was a census taken a number of times. There's all these names and everything in this book. This is the book that most people never read. Because you got enthusiastic about Genesis. Exodus, yeah, okay, you can follow it. Leviticus was like, okay, I'll, I'll kind of tolerate it. And you get to Numbers, you go, I'm done reading through the Bible. I'm never going to do it again. So just understand what the book is about. It's, it's actually a book um, about, it, it's about stubbornness, it's about sorrow. This video actually that you just showed was great. I've never seen that. Who did that one? Worship media, of course they did. Who knows, kids and adults, how long from when, when the Israelites left Egypt until they went into the promised land, don't answer yet, until they went into the promised land, how long was it supposed to take? 40 what? No, it was not supposed to take 40 years. Not six years. 40 days. It was supposed to take 40 days. I knew somebody would eventually guess it, but that's more of a guess. So the real answer is 40 days, and instead it took 40 years. And one of the things about the book of Numbers is we can look at it, if you're going to follow the story of Israel, especially as you saw the video, we can look at it and say, what's with these Israelites? God is like in there, he talks to them, he's in their story, he's in their lives, he's actively involved with them, and yet they keep disobeying him, they keep falling, they keep struggling. What's with these Israelites? The reason why we need this book is because the question also, Christian, is what's wrong with us? We do the same cycle. And, and what we know is what they didn't know. They knew they eventually would have a king. And it was only like loosely prophesied to them. It was very vague. We have a very well-defined definition of who the king is that has redeemed us. And his name is what? Jesus. Perfect. So here, where are we at? Promised land, stubbornness, resistance. One of the other things that we can get encouraged by the book of Numbers is it's a great reminder no matter how many times we mess up, make stupid choices, just or got weird wrong thinking going on in our lives, no matter how many times we do that, our Lord and Savior, our God is a forgiving God, a loving God. Even when we fail, he is loving and grace-filled towards us. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to actually just teach one little portion out of the book of Numbers. And it's going to be this, this chapter up here, uh, 21, in verses 4 through 9. And I'm actually going to have a video to show it, because it's such a short story that we would rather depend on a video. Moses and the Israelites traveled in the wilderness on a long journey. The people were impatient, and they complained. Why did you lead us into the wilderness? We're going to die here. There's no bread, there's no water. We don't like the food we have. So God responded by sending venomous snakes that bit the Israelites. Many of the people died. The Israelites went to Moses and they said, we sinned by complaining. Please talk to God for us. Ask him to take away the snakes. So Moses spoke to God for the people. 
God told Moses what to do. Make a snake image and put it on a pole. And when anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. So Moses did what God said. He made a bronze snake and mounted it on a pole. And whenever someone was bitten, that person looked at the bronze snake and they recovered. God sent snakes to punish the people, but anyone who was bitten could look at the snake on the pole and then live. We deserve to die because of our sin. But anyone who looks to Jesus on the cross and trusts in him will live forever with God. So, which of your kids was paying super close attention to this video? Super close. Do you want to come up and tell me about it, one of you two? Come on up. You're, I'm going to have you retell the story. It's super simple, and I'll help you with this. You want to come up? No? Go ahead. Becky, do you still have that microphone? Yeah, we need a microphone. And all you're going to do is you're just going to tell us what you know about the story. It doesn't have to be word perfect. It doesn't have to be accurate. Accuracy would be good, but it doesn't have to be. But so you're on. The people were complaining about how Moses sent them into the desert and saying, we're complaining about, hey, we don't have any food. We don't have any water. Why would God send us here? So... They realized that was sin since God sent snakes to bite the Israelites. And the Israelites realized their sin. So they asked Moses, how can we repent? How can we say that God, we were wrong? And God told Moses to put a snake, a bronze snake, and whoever looks at it will be healed. So that's kind of how... Yeah, that's the story. That is the story. Very good. Excellent. Now, without me raising my hand, have any of you ever complained to God about something that's not fair in your life? Yeah. Never. 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 What's with these Israelites? I mean, he's feeding them every day. Okay, so kids, this next portion... Uh, Thank you for telling us that, because that's the way we learn, repetitive teaching, repetitive re-storytelling. And um, so the story's real simple. And should I call an adult up? Ivan, should I call you up? Kids, I'm going to ask us uh, some questions here. What were the people complaining about? Grayson. Yeah, they didn't like the, ma the manna that was like dry crackers maybe to them. Yeah, so they were they were complaining. Primarily, what they're complaining about people is they don't think God's taking care of them the way that they should be taken care of, the way they deserve, the way that they want Him to care for them. And Moses was not like also doing that for them. So there's kind of two complaints going on here. Moses, you're not taking care of us, and our God is not taking care of us. So next question: How did God respond to their complaint? He sent. Venomous snakes, those are the type that bite and then leave their venom in you, right? Now, here's, a, here's a, another thing, Becky. I don't think you brought this up, but you did a great job anyhow. On the website, there is like a daily devotional also. And a couple of days ago, this story talked about the venomous bite and how the venom goes in and then it takes time to go into your system in the same way that our own sins happen. You know, like some, we start kind of letting something in and it doesn't affect you right away necessarily, but over time. Things come into your system. So God responds by saying, well, if you guys want something, I'll send you some snakes instead. If you want me to, if you're complaining. So how did the people respond to the snakes besides dying? Besides dying. Yeah, they want them to go away. It's kind of weird, huh? It's like it's a weird response to want the snakes to go away. But they, what they did is they realized, hey, we think we sinned against God, and we kind of don't want these snakes anymore. Next question. How did God heal them? Wait, wait, Grayson, you've already answered. Over here, over here. How did God, go ahead. How did God heal them? Keep going. She said with the venomous snakes, but that's how, 
he let them know that they weren't asking him the right thing or talk, uh, treating him the right way. So, yeah, there was a snake put up on a pole that they could look at, and that's where they would get healing from. That all they had to do was choose to look at the snake. So here's the last question. What happened if somebody didn't want to look at the snake? Go ahead, Grayson. They would die. And so, like, so in other words, it's really simple. You're sick because you got bit by a snake. If you want to live, what do you do? What if you don't look at the snake? So it's real simple. This is like this is just clear cut. There's no there's no trickery involved. God isn't saying that they have to go to church. They have to sing songs. They have to memorize scripture. They have to do certain prayers. He's saying I'm going to make this so simple that everyone can do it, and I'm going to have it on a pole where everyone can see it, that you don't have to go into some special place. But you know what's odd is that God chose, as this symbol, he chose the symbol of death to bring life. It's kind of a weird thing, and as Christians, we're like, oh, yeah, I kind of see where this is going. Imagine you weren't a Christian back then, and you haven't been like inundated with the teachings of the cross. It's kind of a weird thing. The snake brought death. The bronze snake brings healing. And by facing the symbol of death, by looking at that symbol of death, it brought life. It's, a, it's, it's just that simple. It's not a complex story. And God takes sin very seriously. And when they were sinning against him, he said, I want you guys to understand the seriousness of your sin. And the seriousness leads to death. And because God is holy and he hates sin, those who looked at it, because they were dying, they knew that they were being judged for their sin. But he loves people, and he is so full of grace. God loves people. He's so full of grace, kindness towards them, that he provided a way, and in fact the only way, to get healed of the venomous snake bite. And by looking at that pole, the people were saved. And in, and in modern Christian language, looking up at that snake to find healing, what would we call that? Would we call that grace? Would we call it mercy? Or would we call it faith? Because it is by faith you are saved. Yes, remember those memory verses you did in Sunday school or in, maybe at Impact even? It's by, and so your faith saves you. It's God's grace that leads us to his faith. So one night, I'm going, to, I'm going to transition now. That's the book of Numbers. It's a real simple story, super long book, teeny tiny story. Great story, though, because now we're going to connect it to the Jesus story. And unless you haven't learned a lot about the Jesus story in your life, it'll make it, um, you know, the transition is like obvious here. So one night, Jesus is talking to this man. And this man, his name is Nicodemus. Does anyone know who Nicodemus is as a kid? Who is Nicodemus? Anybody know? Was he a disciple of Jesus? Adults can answer. Was wait, was was Nicodemus a disciple of Jesus? Wrong. He was with Joseph when Joseph took the body of Jesus and he buried the body of Jesus. Or did they afterwards? Yeah. But Nicodemus is with Joseph at the end after the crucifixion. And so um, Nicodemus became a believer. In a follower of Jesus. So we've got to give the guy some respect. Now I lost my place. So Jesus, but before he believed in Jesus, him and some other guys were probably having some questions about Jesus because he's doing some really awesome stuff that only religious men or a man sent from God could do. And he, um, Nicodemus asked Jesus questions about Jesus. Like, who are you? Who sent you? What, what do we need to know about you? And Jesus uses this very story to explain who he is and still is. And so as he's talking to this man, it's found in the Gospel of John in the, in the third chapter. As he's talking to this man, he says this, just as Moses was lifted up, I'm sorry, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so will I, and I added that, so too will I, or, so, uh, or I, so too I, the Son of Man, must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him or looks at him may be saved and found eternal life, as the, as the verse says. What is, uh, what's being said here? When, when the guy says, who are you? 
who are you? What's Jesus' response? And be, like, in the first, maybe the first sentence, the first top sentence might have kind of an answer. Yeah? Go, up, go above that word man. Who is he, first of all, comparing himself to? Uh, the snake. Now, I've got to be careful here. Don't think about the serpent in Genesis. Like, just, like get, just get out of that mindset. He's comparing himself to saying, remember that story that you all know? Because these are now Jewish people living in Israel, and, uh, and he's talking to a Pharisee or a, or a high teacher of the law, and uh, he's like a pastor, basically. And Jesus says, he's saying, remember how Moses lifted up that snake in the wilderness? Well, so will I, the Son of Man, I have to be lifted up so that everyone who believes in me will have what? Eternal life. Eternal life. So Jesus uses this story because it's a picture of himself. And like the bronze snake, Jesus was lifted up on the cross. It, it's, so, it's such an obvious thing of where the story is going that looking at him, trusting in who he is, is the only way. Was there any other way in the story of Numbers to get the venomous snake bite healed. No, there was only one way. Is there any way other than through Jesus Christ to come to salvation, to come to, fa to the Father in heaven, to be saved? No, there's only one way. And, and it's maybe narrow-minded, but that's just that's what we're taught. It's just the answer. It's just the only way. And in fact, it's so simple, we have a tendency as humans to reject it. We think, shouldn't we do something? Shouldn't we be trying harder, doing more, memorizing things, doing religious things, going to religious practices? And God says, let's start, first of all, by taking a look at my son. There's only one way for our sins to be removed, to be saved from death, for us to be born again. So why would God do this for us? Like, why? Because God is full of grace. He's full of love. Why would God do this for us? And here's the answer. It's found in the next two verses. For God, hey, I know this passage. This is one of those verses as a Christian you probably can say without really thinking much about it. And I'm empathetic to that because I've been a, an ordained minister for decades now. And I'm horrible at verse memorization. I'm just going to let you know that. That if that's your problem, it's my problem too. But this one I got nailed down. And it's and we're going to see this when we're watching the 49ers win later today. Some, somebody will be holding John 3.16 up there. I was reminiscing earlier about when the 49ers beat the San Diego Chargers in a Super Bowl. On this very day, this very day, the 29th of January. Anyhow, for God so loved the world that we're asking, why would God do this for us? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, shall not die, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. There's no other way to heaven except through Jesus Christ. And here's where I want to pause just for a second. And I'm speaking right now to, more to the adults. For some odd reason, and I don't know why, but for some reasons, a lot of Christians, they don't present this heart very well to the world. And they act like Jesus came into the world to condemn it. Does that make sense? To, to point out our sins and then to make us feel bad about it. And so we think as Christians, for some reason, we think that, that we should condemn the world, that we should, we should look at the atrocities and the things that happen in our world and condemn it. But Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn. I came to save. I came to save. And we have to remember verse 17 and, and couple it with verse 16. Keep them together because this is how much God loves us. He allowed his only son to be put on a pole so that anyone, anyone or most people, anyone and everyone that looks at Jesus on the cross and puts their faith in him will receive eternal life. It's it's simple, but it's true. This is, the, this is from the Word of God, and the Word of God is always true. 
We might misinterpret it. We might misunderstand it. We might misapply it. But his word is always true. It doesn't change. So what happens when a, a current modern person refuses to look at Jesus? They say, I know about this whole story, but I don't care about it. I don't want anything to do with it. Do they live or do they have eternal death? Yeah. And I'm not trying to scare anyone. I'm just pointing out what the scripture teaches us. That by refusing rescue, by refusing forgiveness, by refusing healing, God's love cannot come to you if you refuse to accept what Jesus Christ has done. And when you reject Christ, you're actually rejecting the Father's love. And your issue of not looking at the cross is a heart issue. It's some sort of a pride issue. It's some sort of a, a, an issue that you need to work through with God. But refusing to look at Jesus is to refusing is to refuse the Father's love. And there, therefore, it's super easy to determine what's going to happen when you don't accept the Father's love. And we'll go to this last verse here. Um, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God, the one and only Son. And I want to look at this next uh, last part of this passage when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Again, these are Jesus' words. These are not speculations of what does Christianity teach. This is Jesus' words. Is there another, another slide? That one. It says this is the verdict. This is Jesus talking. Light came into the world. What do we know from the Gospel of John? That Jesus is the what? Yeah, he's the light of the world, the way, the truth, the life. He's the bread, he's the water. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness. Instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. In other words, I don't want anyone to know what I'm doing, even though we all know what you're doing. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. And that's the story of Jesus. That's the story of Jesus in Numbers. That's the story of Jesus in John, Mark, Matthew. What's the other gospel book? Does anyone know? You've got Matthew, Mark. John, Grayson, you've run out of answers already. <laughs> Luke, I mean, who are, where else would it be? That's it. There's four of them. Perfect. So this is pretty clear, that you are treasured by the Father because he sent his son to prove how much you are treasured. And even more precious is your rescue from eternal death. So God did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. And so, going back to the kids for a second, I want you to understand something. When I was a young person about your age, I didn't know this story. And I got older and older, and as I got older and older, I started getting into more and more trouble and more and more mischief and things that, that began to affect my personality and who I was, affected friendships, because I didn't know about this story. And when I finally found out about this person, who died on the cross for me, and all I had to do was accept his death as a loving sacrifice of my life, that, or for my life, I'm sorry. Once I was able to do that, my life changed. And I believe that there's probably people in this room today that think they know Jesus because they know something about him, or they think they understand him better than they actually do because they maybe went to Sunday school or they went to VBS, no offense to VBS because it's a great program. They went to, to uh, good, good news clubs or these other things, uh, Christian camps. And not that those things are bad. They're actually excellent. But just because you did those things doesn't mean you got saved. The only way to salvation, the only way to have your sins forgiven and to know that you'll live eternally in heaven with God is by looking at whom? Jesus. Do we look at a snake? On a, on, a, on a pole anymore? No. Do we look at Jesus on the cross? Yes. And as the story that Becky uh, showed on the video explained, it wasn't just that Jesus died on the cross. Because his death paid for our sins. What is most important is that he rose from the dead. 
because it proved that he has power even over death. Even death could not hold him. And so I'm going to ask uh, Jared, is it just you or the band that's coming up? In fact, you're going to sing and close us out? Yeah, come on. Which song are we doing? Which song are we doing? No, I'm just going to close us out in prayer if that's okay. No, I want you to sing. No, no, no. I, We're <laughs> good. I don't have a song prepared today, so... Next time, next yeah. time for you. So anyhow, so. Becky, awesome. take it away. You're awesome. on. Thank you for that wonderful message, Pastor Bill. So like my friends here in the front row, I was a church kid. I loved church growing up. You guys have heard my story several times. Um, and I decided to follow Jesus when I was only eight years old. But over the course of my life, um, I grew in maturity and understanding him. So I pray that for each one of you today. So I'm going to go ahead and close this in prayer. We have lunch for you guys um, out on the patio or even in the lobby. I'm not really sure where it is. It's in the lobby. It's in the lobby today because it's a little cold outside. So let me go ahead and pray for our lunch and then we'll head out. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for um, the rain you're going to provide to our um, area that we so desperately need it. Um, we thank you for each um, child in this room, Father. Um, we pray for this next generation. I pray over these children um, God, that you protect them and guide them um, and lead us as we teach them your truths. Um, you say to teach your truths to every generation. And Father, we thank you for that opportunity to pour into these kids that you've given us here at this church. So um, I pray over the families and I pray over our meal today. God bless the food um, to our bodies. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>